The Happy Prince by Oscar Wilde. High above the city, on a tall column, stood the statue of the Happy Prince. He was gilded all over with thin leaves of fine gold. For eyes, he had two bright sapphires, and a large red ruby glowed on his sword hilt. He was very much admired indeed. He is as beautiful as a weathercock, remarked one of the town councillors who wished to gain a reputation for having artistic tastes. Only not quite so useful, he added, fearing least people should think him impractical, which he really was not. Why can't you be like the happy prince? asked his sensible mother of her little boy who was crying for the moon. The happy prince never dreams of crying for anything. I'm glad there is someone in the world who is quite happy, moderate a disappointed man as he gazed at the wonderful statue. He looks just like an angel, said the charity children as they came out of the cathedral in their bright scarlet cloaks and their clean white pinafores. How do you know, said the mathematical master, you have never seen one. But we have in our dreams, answered the children, and the mathematical master frowned and looked very severe for he did not approve of children dreaming. One night there flew over the city a little swallow. His friends had gone away to Egypt six weeks before, but he had stayed behind, for he was in love with the most beautiful reed. He had met her early in the spring as he was flying down the river after a big yellow moth and had been so attracted by her slender waist that he had stopped to talk to her. So I love you, said the swallow, who liked to come to the point at once, and the reed made him a low bow. So he flew around and round her, touching the water with his wings and making silver ripples. This was his courtship, and it lasted all through the summer. It's a ridiculous attachment, twittered the other swallows. She has no money and far too many relations. And indeed, the river was quite full of reeds. Then, when the autumn came, they all flew away. After they had gone, he felt lonely and began to tire of his lady love. She has no conversation, he said and I'm afraid that she's a coquette, for she's always flirting with the wind, and certainly, whenever the wind blew, the reed made the most graceful courtesies. I admit that she's domestic, continued, but I love traveling, and my wife consequently should love traveling also. Will you come away with me? He said finally to her, but the reed shook her head, was so attached to her home. You have been trifling with me, he cried. I'm off to the pyramids. Goodbye, and he flew away. All day long he flew, and at night time he arrived at the city. Where shall I put up, he said. I hope the town has made preparations. Then he saw the statue on the tall column. I will put up there, he cried. It is a fine position, with plenty of fresh air. So he alighted just between the feet of the happy prince. I have a golden bedroom, he said softly to himself as he looked round. And he prepared to go to sleep. But just as he was putting his head under his wing, a large drop of water fell on him. 
What a curious thing, he cried. There is not a single cloud in the sky. The stars are quite clear and bright, and yet it is raining. The climate in the north of Europe is really dreadful. The reed used to like the rain, but that was merely her selfishness. Then another drop fell. What is the use of, the, of a statue if it cannot keep the rain off, he said. I must look for a good chimney pot, and he determined to fly away. But before he had opened his wings, a third drop fell. He looked up and saw, ah, what did he see? The eyes of the happy prince were filled with tears, and tears were running down his golden cheeks. His face was so beautiful in the moonlight that the little swallow was filled with pity. Who are you? he said. I'm the happy prince. Why are you weeping then? asked the swallow. You have quite drenched me. When I was alive and had a human heart, answered the statue, I did not know what tears were, for I live in the palace of Saint Sanssouci, where sorrow is not allowed to enter. In the daytime I played with my companions in the garden, and in the evening I led the dance in the great hall. Round the garden ran a very lofty wall, but I never cared to ask what lay be beyond it. Everything about me was so beautiful. My courtiers called me the happy prince, and happy indeed I was. If pleasure be happiness. So I lived, and so I died, and now that I am dead, they have set me up here so high that I can see all the ugliness and all the misery of my city, and though my heart is made of lead, yet I cannot choose but weep. What? Is he not solid gold? said the swallow to himself. He was too polite to make any personal remarks out loud. Far away, continued the statue in a low musical voice, far away in a little street, there is a poor house. One of the windows is open, and through it I can see a woman seated at a table. Her face is thin and worn, and she has coarse red hands, all picked by the needle, for she is a seamstress. She is embroidering passion flowers on a satin gown for the loveliest of the queen's maids of honor to wear at the next court ball. In a bed in the corner of the room her little boy is lying ill. He has a fever and he is asking for oranges. His mother has nothing to give him but river water. So he is crying, swallow, swallow, little swallow. Will you not bring her ruby out of my sword hilt? My feet are fastened to this pedestal, and I cannot move. I am waited for in Egypt, said the swallow. My friends are flying up and down the Nile, and talking to the large lotus flowers. Soon they will go to sleep in the top of the great king. The king is there himself in his painted coffin. He is wrapped in yellow linen and embalmed with spices. Round his neck is a chain of pale green jade, and his hands are like withered leaves. Swallow, swallow, little swallow, said the prince. Will you not stay with me for one night and be my messenger? The boy is so thirsty and the mother so sad. I don't think I like boys, answered the swallow. Last summer when I was staying on the river, there were 
two rude boys, the miller's sons, who were always throwing stones at me. They never hit me, of course. We swallows fly far too well for that. And besides, I come of a family famous for its agility, but still it was a mark of disrespect. But the happy prince looked so sad that little swallow was sorry. It's very cold here, he said, but I will stay with you for one night and be your messenger. Thank you, little swallow, said the prince. So the swallow picked out the great ruby from the prince's sword and flew away with it in his beak over the roofs of the town. He passed by the cathedral tower where the white marble angels were sculptured. He passed by the palace and heard the sound of dancing. A beautiful girl came out on the balcony with her lover. How wonderful the stars are! said to her, and how wonderful is the power of love. I hope my dress will be ready in time for the state ball, she answered. I have ordered passion flowers to be embroidered on it, but the seamstresses are so lazy. He passed over the river and saw the lanterns hanging to the masts of the ships. He passed over the ghetto and saw the old Jews bargaining with each other and weighing out money in copper scales. At last he came to the poor house and looked in. The boy was tossing feverishly on his bed, and the mother had fallen asleep. She was so tired, and he opened and laid the great ruby on the table beside the woman's thimble. Then he flew gently around the bed, fanning the boy's forehead with his wings. How cool I feel, said the boy. I must be getting better, and he sank into a delicious slumber. Then the swallow flew back to the happy prince and told him that he had done. It's curious, he remarked, but I feel quite warm now, although it's so cold. That is because you have done a good action, said the prince, and the little swallow began to think, and then he fell asleep. Thinking always made him sleepy. When day broke, he flew down to the river and had a bath. What a remarkable phenomenon, said the professor of ornithology as he was passing over the bridge. A swallow in winter. And he wrote a long letter about it to the local newspaper. Everyone quoted it. It was full of so many words that they could not understand. Tonight I go to Egypt, said the swallow, and he was in high spirits at the prospects. He visited all the public monuments and sat a long time on top of church steeple. Wherever he went, the sparrows chirruped and said to each other, what a distinguished stranger, so he enjoyed himself very much. When the moon rose, he flew back to the happy prince. Have you any commissions for Egypt? He cried. I'm just starting. Swallow, swallow, little swallow, said the prince. Will you not stay with me one night longer? I'm waited for in Egypt, answered the swallow. Tomorrow, my friends will fly up to the second cataract. The river horse couches there among the bar rushes, and on a great granite throne sits the god Amnon. All night long he watches the stars, and when the morning star shines, he utters one cry of joy. 
and then he is silent. At noon, the yellow lions come down to the water's edge to, th to drink. They have eyes like green barrels, and their roar is louder than the roar of the cataracts. Swallow, swallow, little swallow, said the prince. Far away across the city, I see a young man in a garret. He is leaning over the desk, covered with papers, and in a tumbler by his side, there is a bunch of withered violets. His hair is brown and crisp, and his lips are red as he pomegranates and he has large and dreamy eyes. He's trying to finish a play for the director of the theater, but he is too cold to write anymore. There is no fire in the grates, and hunger has made him faint. I will wait with you one night longer, said the swallow, who really had a good heart. Shall I take him another ruby? Alas, I have no ruby now, said the prince. My eyes are all that I have left. They are made of rare sapphires, which were brought out of India a thousand years ago. Pluck out one of them and take it to him. He will sell it to the jeweler and buy food and firewood and finish his play. Dear prince, said the swallow. I cannot, I cannot do that, and he began to weep. Swallow, swallow, little swallow, said the prince, do as I command you. I'm come to bid you goodbye. He cried. Swallow, swallow, little swallow, said the prince. Will you not stay with me one night longer? It is winter, answered the swallow, and the chill snow will soon be here. In Egypt the sun is warm on the green palm trees, and the crocodiles lie in the mud and look lazily about them. My companions are building a nest in the temple of Baalbek, and the pink and white doves are watching them, and cooing to each other. Dear prince, I must leave you, but I will never forget you, and next spring I will bring you back two beautiful jewels in place of those you have given away. The ruby shall be redder than a red rose and the sapphire shall be as blue as the great sea. In the square below, said the happy prince, there stands a little match girl. She has let her matches fall in the gutter, and they are all spoiled. Her father will beat her if she does not bring home, bring home some money, and she is crying. She has no shoes or stockings, and her little head is bare. Pluck out my other eye and give it to her, and her father will not beat her. I will stay with you one night longer, said the swallow, but I cannot pluck out your eye. You would be quite blind then. Swallow, swallow, little swallow, said the prince, do as I command you. Dear little swallow, said the prince, you tell me of marvelous things, but more marvelous than anything is the suffering of man and of a woman. There is no mystery so great as misery. 
Fly over my city, little swallow, and tell me what you see there. So the swallow flew over the great city and saw the rich making merry in their beautiful houses, while the beggars were sitting at the gates. They flew into dark lanes and saw the white faces of starving children looking out listlessly at the black streets. Under the archway of a bridge, two little boys were lying in one another's arms to try and keep themselves warm. How hungry we are, he said. You must not lie here, shouted the watchman, and they wandered out into the rain. Then he flew back and told the prince what he had seen. I'm covered with fine gold, said the prince. You must take it off, leaf by leaf, and give it to my poor. The living all always think that the gold can make them happy. Leaf after leaf of the fine gold the swallow picked off, till the happy prince looked quite dull and grey. Leaf after leaf of the fine gold he brought to the poor, and the children's faces grew rosier, and they laughed and played games in the streets. We have bread now, they cried. Then the snow came, and after the snow came the frost. The streets looked as if they were made of silver. They were so bright and glistening. Long icicles like crystal daggers hang down from the eaves of the houses. Everybody went about in furs, and the little boys wore scarlet caps and skated on the ice. The poor little swallow grew colder and colder, but he would not leave the prince. He loved him too well. He picked up cramps outside the baker's door. When the baker was not looking and tried to keep himself warm by flapping his wings. But at last he knew that he was going to die. He had just strength to fly up to the prince's shoulder once more. Goodbye, dear prince, he murmured. Will you let me kiss your hand? I'm glad that you are going to Egypt at last, little swallow, said the prince. You have stayed too long here, but you must kiss me on the lips, for I love you. It's not to Egypt that I'm going, said the swallow. I'm going to the house of death. Death is the brother of sleep, is he not? And he kissed the happy prince on the lips and fell down dead at his feet. At that moment, a curious crack sounded inside the statue, as if something had broken. The fact is that the, the leaden heart had snapped right in two. It certainly was a dreadfully hard frost. Early the next morning, the mayor was walking in the square below in company with the town councillors. As they passed the column, he looked up at the statue. Dear me, how shabby the happy prince looks, he said. How shabby indeed, cried the town councillors, who always agreed with the mayor, and they went up to look at it. Ruby has fallen out of his sword. His eyes are gone, and his he is golden. No longer, said the Meyer. In fact, he is little better than a beggar. Little better than a beggar, said the town councillors. And here is actually a dead bird at his feet, continued the Meyer. We must really issue a proclamation that birds are not 
to be allowed to die here. And the town clerk made a note of the suggestion. So they pulled down the statue of the happy prince as he's no longer beautiful, he's no longer useful, said the arts professor at the university. Then they melted the statue in a furnace and the mayor held a meeting of the corporation to decide what was to be done with the metal. We must have another statue, of course, he said, and it shall be a statue of myself. For myself, said each of the town councillors, and they quarreled. When I last heard of them, they were quarreling still. What a strange thing, said the overseer of the workmen at the foundry. This broken lead hearts will not melt in the furnace. We must throw it away. So they threw it on a dust heap where the dead swallow was also lying. Bring me the two most precious things in the city, said God to one of his angels. And the angel brought him the leaden heart and the dead bird. You have rightly chosen, said God. For in my garden of paradise, this little bird shall sing forevermore. And in my city of gold, the happy prince shall praise me.